This lesson is on the bacteria known as Neisseria gonorrhea. We're going to talk about how this bacteria causes infection and other complications of infection with Neisseria gonorrhea. We'll also talk about some important signs and symptoms to watch out for, and we'll also discuss how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. So Neisseria gonorrhea is a bacteria that causes a sexually transmitted infection, or STI. So this would be the bacteria that causes gonorrhea. Now, it not only causes a sexually transmitted infection, but it can cause other types of infections. We'll discuss those later on in this lesson. The transmission of this bacteria occurs via sexual contact or via vertical transmission. So sexual transmission is going to occur between individuals, whereas vertical transmission is going to occur during vaginal delivery and the neonate or newborn is going to become infected. So we'll talk about some of the complications of this vertical transmission later on as well. So gonorrhea is actually the second most common STI. It commonly co-occurs with other STIs, especially chlamydia trachomatis. So chlamydia and gonorrhea both go together. And there are particular risk factors for getting an infection with this bacteria. These include unprotected sexual activity, multiple sex partners, male homosexuality, previous sexually transmitted diseases or infections, and illicit drug use. Now let's talk about some important details with regards to this bacteria and how it causes infection. So Neisseria gonorrhea is a gram-negative diplococcus. Gram-negative means that when we do a gram staining, the bacteria will stain pink because of a thinner peptidoglycan cell wall. And it's a diplococcus because it is two cocci together. Now, Neisseria gonorrhea is an obligate intracellular pathogen. Obligate means that it has to do this particular mode of living. And it's intracellular, meaning that it is inside cells. So it's a intracellular pathogen or parasite, so meaning that it lives inside our cells and it has to live in this way in order to replicate and survive. Now, this bacteria only infects humans in nature, and there are multiple strains of Neisseria gonorrhea. We're not going to get into too much detail here, but some of these include serum-sensitive strains and serum-resistant strains. So this terminology has to do with the strain's ability to evade the complement cascade. So if it is a serum sensitive strain. It means that it is sensitive to the complement cascade, so humans can generally deal with these strains better, so their immune system can deal with it better. And serum resistant strains are able to evade this mechanism. They're more resistant to the host immune system. Now, when an individual is exposed to these Neisseria gonorrhea organisms, if the organisms come into contact with that person's mucous membranes, this can lead to an infection. So some of the mucous membranes that can be invaded by this organism include the lower urogenital tract. This is actually the most common mucous membrane that's affected. It can also infect the pharynx, so this is the throat. It can also infect the anus and rectum and also the conjunctiva of the eyes. We're going to talk about some of the differences in signs and symptoms with regards to these later on in this lesson. So when you get exposed to these bacteria, either through sexual contact or through vertical transmission, the bacteria is going to try to adhere to your cells. And what they do is they actually use what are called pili. And pili are these little hair-like strands that come off of the organism. They can actually use these pili to adhere to epithelial cells. So they can adhere to these cells and they can use these pili to move around from cell to cell. And the particular epithelial cells that are going to most commonly be affected are the cuboidal and columnar epithelial cells. And then when they use these pili to attach to epithelial cells, they also have what are called opacity associated proteins or OPA proteins on their cell surface. And they use these to also adhere and use them to enter or invade into those epithelial cells. And depending on the host cell that they're entering into, if it's an epithelial cell in the cervix, for instance, they can use the host cell complement receptors type 3 or CR3 as a potential gateway into that host cell. So once they get inside an epithelial cell, they can start multiplying in that cell. What will then happen is the host immune system will bring in immune cells into that cell, and eventually there can be purulence, so pus, there can be slothing off of these cells, so there can be discharge, and this is going to cause a lot of the signs and symptoms we'll talk about later on in this lesson. So more specifically, when we look at males and females who are infected by this organism, males are going to lead to a urethritis. Urethritis is an inflammation of the urethra. So the urethra is here. And in some cases, the organisms can invade into the epididymis and into the testis. So this can lead to particular complications we'll discuss later on. 
And then in females, these organisms can enter into the cervix and they can cause an inflammation of the cervix known as cervicitis. So they can get into the cervix, especially on the inner side of the cervix, so endocervicitis. And in some cases, they can spread up even further into the female reproductive system. And in this case, this would be considered retrograde spread. And this occurs in approximately 20% of patients. Now, once these organisms have infected individuals, they can be spread via pre-ejaculatory fluid, semen, or vaginal fluid. And with regards to sperm and semen, the Neisseria gonorrhea uses something called lipoligosaccharide, or LOS, to attach to sperm for transmission purposes. So they can attach to the sperm in the ejaculate, and that can help with their transmission to other patients. Now, the risk for getting gonorrhea is going to depend on who is the one spreading it. So in males, if it's male-to-female transmission, the male-to-female transmission rate is 50 to 70 percent per contact, whereas with female-to-male transmission rate, it's only 20 percent per contact. So some of this has to do with the ability of these organisms to attach to use sperm as a transmission mechanism. Now, there haven't been other transmission rates looked at from male to male or female to female. So these are the only numbers we have, but we can see that males can transmit this more readily than females can. And when an individual does get infected by this organism, the incubation period is roughly 1 to 14 days. It may be less than 10 days in most cases. This is the period where patients have the infection, they're infected by this organism, but they don't experience symptoms yet. So this is the time between infection and symptom onset. We'll first talk about symptoms in males. So as mentioned before, males are going to mostly experience urethritis, and males are actually going to be the host that is more likely to experience symptoms. More than 90% of males are going to be symptomatic. So with regards to urethritis, this is going to lead to LUTs or lower urinary tract symptoms. This can include dysuria, burning sensation when urinating, can lead to irritation when urinating, can lead to urinary frequency or urgency as well. And then what can be more specific to Neisseria gonorrhea is going to be urethral discharge. So first is going to be a serous discharge. It's going to be a clear fluid that starts to discharge out of the urethra. And then approximately three days later, the discharge can increase in volume and become purulent, meaning that it can become pus-like. So it's that white pussy discharge that can be exuded out of the urethra. And again, usually three days later after the onset of that serous or clear mucousy discharge. Some patients can also experience acute epididymoorchitis. This is where there is inflammation of the epididymis and the testicles. This is going to be mostly unilateral, so one-sided. And these patients can experience scrotal pain and a fever. And then in some patients, there can be urethral strictures. This is mostly going to be in patients who have left this to be untreated. And this can lead to issues with urination or intermittent urine stream. Now let's discuss the symptoms that can be found in female patients. So symptoms in females are going to only occur in less than 50% of patients who have Neisseria gonorrhea. So some of the most important ones to make note of here are vaginal discharge. This is actually going to be the most common initial symptom. It's going to be purulent. Again, it's going to be pus-like. It can be thin and it can be odorous in some cases. So it can have a smell to it. There can also be dysuria, so a burning sensation when urinating. There can be dyspareunia, so this is a painful sensation during intercourse. There can be abnormal uterine bleeding as well. This can be intermenstrual bleeding, so between periods or between menstruations, there can be abnormal bleeding. There can also be bleeding postcoitally, which means that after intercourse, there can be bleeding as well. And there can also be postmenopausal bleeding, which is bleeding after menopause. And some patients can also have pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID. So this is where we talked about that retrograde spread in 20% of patients who have this. So pelvic inflammatory disease is going to involve abdominal pain. More specifically, it's going to be right lower quadrant pain. So right lower quadrant, if we were to look onto the abdomen of a patient, we can split it up into four quadrants. This is the right side of the patient. This is the left side of the patient because we're looking on them. So the right lower quadrant is going to be down in this area here. Pelvic pain can also be important as well. So pelvic pain is going to be down here. So right lower quadrant pain and pelvic pain are going to be the typical pain we see with PID. And we can also see fever and nausea and vomiting in more uncommon cases. And then there can be pregnancy complications that can occur if patients are pregnant and are infected with gonorrhea. They can have issues with pregnancy. These include preterm birth. And other complications can include infertility. Because female patients 
may not even experience symptoms. They may not even know that they're infected with gonorrhea, and then they may have issues with infertility as a result. So this can be something to look out for. Ectopic pregnancy is more likely to occur as well. So ectopic pregnancy is going to be the implantation of the embryo outside of the uterus. So that can be in the fallopian tubes, for instance. And then we can also see issues with Bartholin's gland abscesses as well. Now, there are other gonorrheal conditions and findings we should talk about here. These include rectal gonorrhea, rectal infection. We can see this in male-to-male sexual transmission. So this is going to involve pruritus or an itching sensation. There can be rectal pain and tenismus as well. And tenismus is going to be a feeling that you need to defecate, but you really don't have to. It's just a feeling like you do. We can also see a condition known as ophthalmia neonatorum. So this is a condition that occurs in neonates. This is where there is vertical transmission during vaginal delivery. If there are organisms in the vaginal cavity, those organisms can infect the infant, they can infect their conjunctiva of their eyes and lead to bilateral conjunctivitis. Very important, it's bilateral, it's going to be both sides. And then these infants can experience red eyes, sore and burning eyes, and they can also have purulent discharge and eye crusting, as you can see in this image here. And then in neonates, these patients are also at risk for systemic infection as well. So it's also something to look out for. And in some patients who are infected by gonorrhea, they can have disseminated gonococcal infection. This is very rare. It only occurs in 1% of patients. And it's more likely to be due to an infection with a serum-resistant strain, like we talked about before. So some of the signs and symptoms that can be found in a disseminated gonococcal infection include fever, rash, migratory polyarthritis. Polyarthritis is going to be multiple painful aching and swollen joints, and it's going to be migratory means that these joints that are affected move around. So there can be some joints that are affected one day, but then a few days later, maybe other joints that are affected. Tendinitis, so tendinitis is inflammation of the tendons. And then some patients can have meningitis. So this is an inflammation of the meninges. And the meninges are the layers that cover the brain. And then endocarditis. This is an inflammation of the endocardium, the inner lining of the heart. How do clinicians diagnose gonorrhea? So history and physical examination is going to be important looking out for those risk factors, looking out for those signs and symptoms we talked about before. In males, it's going to be urethral discharge that becomes purulent. In females, it's going to be vaginal discharge that's purulent as well. And then we can have some of those other complications and other symptoms we talked about before. If we were to do a cervical examination, we can see certain findings on the cervix. These include cervical friability. So if you were to touch the cervix, it can become very easy to cause bleeding. This is the reason why we can see intermenstrual bleeding or postmenopausal bleeding or postcoital bleeding. And then cervical motion tenderness. This is where if you were to push onto the cervix, this can cause a sensation of tenderness. This is a more particular finding in pelvic inflammatory disease. So those are some of the physical findings, but in order to make the diagnosis, we have to do some laboratory work. This includes swabbing the site of infection. So if you can get a swab of some of that purulent discharge, that can be helpful. Other ways include first catch urine. So first catch urine is going to be different than other types of issues like urinary tract infection, where you might take a midstream urine. But with regards to gonorrhea, it's important to look for or capture first catch urine. So the first bit of urine that comes out is what we're going to use as a sample. So bacterial culture can be used. If we were to look under a microscope, some of the cells may show inside these diplococci. These diplococci are again going to be the Neisseria gonorrhea. Now bacterial culture has been the gold standard of making the diagnosis of gonorrhea, but it has some drawbacks. It takes time. It usually takes 24 to 72 hours in order to actually get the culture. These organisms can take time to grow, so in order to actually see the organisms, it may take more time than we want to wait for. And then the other problem with bacterial culture is that in collecting and storing and transporting the samples, this can be difficult because some of these organisms may not be able to be viable enough to survive some of those collection and transportation. So another test that can be used to diagnose gonorrhea is what we call nucleic acid amplification test, or NAAT. This has become more popular, it's more sensitive, and there's more specificity, so we don't need to capture some of those organisms and culture them, we just need to get some of the genetics involved with regards to those organisms. And then once we've made that diagnosis, gonorrhea is actually one of the notifiable diseases for public health administrations in a variety of countries, so the CDC, this is one of the ones that we need to report on. Once a clinician has made the diagnosis of gonorrhea, how do they treat it? So the treatment's going to involve ceftriaxone, ceftriaxone, 500 milligrams IM or intramuscular, so it's going to be an injection, and it's going to be one dose. Some other possible alternatives can involve cefixime, 800 milligrams PO, one dose of that. 
And then another alternative, so if the patient has a ceftriaxone allergy, for instance, they can use gentamicin, 240 milligrams IM as one dose as well. And what's important with regards to treating gonorrhea is to also use azithromycin. Now, azithromycin is going to be used as an empirical treatment for chlamydia trachomatis because both of these organisms co-occur so frequently if you are diagnosed with gonorrhea. You use the treatment for gonorrhea, but then you can also use the treatment for chlamydia to make sure you take care of that, which is azithromycin, one to two grams PO or by mouth, one dose. Most of the time it's going to be one gram. In some cases it's going to be two grams, but the higher the dose, the more likely the side effects of nausea and vomiting, for instance. Alternatively, doxycycline can be used, 100 milligrams PO, BID. So PO again is by mouth. BID is twice per day for seven days. So it's important to use both of these antibiotics in less complicated cases. And gonorrhea has been developing more and more resistance over time. It's been found to be resistant to penicillins, for instance. And it's also been found to be resistant to older macrolides like erythromycin. So you wouldn't want to just use azithromycin to treat gonorrhea and chlamydia together. You'd want to use both of these. Gonococcal meningitis, if you have gonococcal meningitis, it's going to be ceftriaxone, one to two grams IV. So it's intravenous. You're going to be hospitalized. It's every 12 to 24 hours. It may be for many weeks, depending on how severe the case is. And again, also using azithromycin, one gram PO, again, to take care of chlamydia. And then with regards to cases of gonococcal arthritis and conjunctivitis, this is going to be ceftriaxone, one gram IM, so a higher dose, and again, the same azithromycin, one gram PO. And with regards to pelvic inflammatory disease, we're even going to use a higher dose of ceftriaxone, two grams IM, plus doxycycline. This is going to be important. Doxycycline is going to be used to treat PID. This is going to be 100 milligrams PO, BID for 14 days, so a longer course. And then in some cases may use metronidazole, so may be added and may not be added, depending on some of the organisms that may be responsible. And then epididymoorchitis is going to use a lower dose of ceftriaxone, 250 milligrams IM, plus doxycycline. Again, we need doxycycline, but again, it's going to be for less time, so it's 100 milligrams POBID for 10 days. So these are some of the ways that we can sort this out when treating gonorrhea, depending on the complication, depending on the subtype of infection. Please check out my lesson on bacterial vaginosis and vaginal candidiasis, and if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching, and hope to see you next time.